Hey guys, this video is about how the rate constant and the rate of the reaction depends upon the temperature, and the equation that describes this for us is called the Arrhenius equation. So, first of all, it ends up that the rate constant is not really a constant. If the temperature changes, the value of the rate constant changes. How it changes with temperature depends upon the specific uh, chemical reaction we're talking about. But in general, um, as temperature increases, the rate constant increases. And it's not a linear relationship either, certainly not linear. That's what this graph shows. We can explain this by looking at the activation energy and um, <clears throat> a reaction coordinate diagram. That, this is called a reaction coordinate diagram. And so the, the reaction we're going to look at is um, the reaction of nitrosyl bromide with itself, BRNO, um, to form two molecules of nitrogen monoxide and bromine. And so <clears throat> this ends up, okay, so first of all, again, a reaction coordinate diagram like this. Um, the y-axis is the potential energy of the system, the reactants in the beginning and the products at the end, and how it changes as the reaction proceeds from all reactants to all products. Now, this particular reaction ends up being an exothermic reaction, and we can tell that because the energy of the products is lower than the energy of the, the reactants by this much here, delta E. Um, now, as we saw before, in order for this reaction to happen, two mo the, in this particular reaction anyway, two molecules of nitrosyl bromide have to come together with enough energy in order to get over this barrier here. When, so these, in this case, they're both gases. The same, same applies for any other reaction, if it's a liquid or what have you. But um, <clears throat> in order for this reaction to happen, what must occur is that two molecules of, in this case, the gas, nitrosyl bromide, must hit, first of all. So we have a container of gas with nitrosyl bromide in it, right? And so the gas the molecules are doing the things that gaseous molecules do, moving around in random directions and straight lines until they hit something, you know, the kinetic molecular theory of gases. Well, so two, just because two molecules of this nitrosyl bromide hit, doesn't mean they're going to react because, for one, they may not have enough energy. If they don't hit with enough energy, they can't get over this barrier and they fall right back down here as separate molecules. Also, they must hit with the correct orientation. They have to be pointed towards each other exactly, well, pretty close to being exactly right in order for this reaction to occur. If they hit with enough energy to get over the barrier, but they're not pointed the right way, then they're just going to bounce off each other and re go back here and end up still as two separate molecules of nitrosyl bromide. Now, if they do happen to hit with the correct orientation and with enough energy, they form what's called a transition state. Um, and that's, that's it. We're able, actually, at this point to use lasers, um, very um, quickly pulsed lasers, um, to probe these molecules as the reaction occurs. And we can actually get a picture of what this looks like. It's really cool um, as the reaction's happening. And so the transition state is when the electrons are just starting to flow and break old bonds and reform new bonds. Okay. Um, so in this case, what's happening is the bond between the nitrogen and the bromine on each molecule is starting to break and we're starting to form a bond between each of the bromine atoms. And and, you know, so you can see, if this doesn't hit with the right orientation, if instead of coming up this way, um, maybe this, um, on this molecule, the oxygen hits the bromine. Well, even if it have, has enough energy, it's not going to um, react because we're not, not, we don't have a bond in the right place. But when it does, after the electrons finish moving around, we end up with our products, two molecules of nitrogen monoxide and a molecule of bromine. Now... <clears throat> Because in a gas, and in a liquid too, um, we have a distribution of energies. So at any given temperature, let's talk about gases because that's the easiest and we have a background from, from our kinetic molecular theory um, work in Chem 101. So <clears throat> because in that gas, we have a distribution of energies. Some of these molecules are moving slower than others and some are moving faster. Um, but that there's some average kinetic energy, which means there's some average speed with which these molecules are moving. And the higher the temperature, 
the higher the average kinetic energy. And so if these molecules, okay, so if these molecules need this amount of kinetic energy when they hit in order to overcome this barrier, um, <clears throat> the higher the temperature, the more molecules there will be in that gas that will have enough energy to overcome this barrier. And at any given instant, more molecules will be colliding with enough energy to get over this barrier. And that means more of them with enough energy and the correct orientation will be colliding to order to get over this barrier. So as we increase the temperature, we have more opportunities for this reaction to happen. And it happens more, more often, which means faster. Okay, that's that. So um, this guy, Arrhenius, discovered, I guess you could say discovered or um, came up with, uh, an equation which describes the relationship um, between temperature and the rate constant. This is called, appropriately, the Arrhenius equation. And it says that K, the rate constant, is equal to um, some constant that depends upon the actual reaction called the frequency factor times E to the minus activation energy over RT. So, in, so this is an exponential. Um, A is called the frequency factor, like I said, and what this does, it takes into account how often those molecules collide with the correct orientation. Um, this factor takes into, you know, the exponential with the activation energy, um, takes into account um, how often they collide with enough energy. So let's go back and make sure we're clear on what that E sub A is. E sub A, the activation energy, is this barrier right here. It's how much energy these molecules need to gain, or to, to have rather, in order to overcome this activation barrier. So R is um, the gas constant in, with joules per kelvin mole of the unit, so 8.3145 is the value we use. T is the temperature, must be in kelvin as always. E is the activation energy, and A is the frequency factor. K, of course, is the rate constant. <clears throat> so if we take the natural log of both sides of the Arrhenius equation, Natural log of k on the left. Remember, natural log of x, y is equal to the natural log of x plus the natural log of y. We get minus Ea over r, 1 over t, plus natural log of the frequency factor a. Um, so if we look at this, this is something that we know that's loving, that we know and love and that is dear to us. <laughs> it's the equation of a straight line. y equals mx plus b, right? Where this, if we plot the natural log of the rate constant, versus 1 over the temperature in Kelvin, we, sh we will get a straight line whose slope is negative activation energy over R and whose y-intercept is natural log of the frequency factor. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we can use that um, to um, do some calculations. For example, um, we can find the activation energy for this reaction, um, or any reaction, if we have data like this. So. Um, so this is data for this reaction right here, the reaction of nitrogen monoxide with ozone to make nitrogen dioxide and oxygen. They're all gases. Um, this is the rate constant at different temperatures. Notice as the temperature increases, the value of the rate constant increases. Um, so um, be, it would be a useful exercise for you guys to do this yourself. Just pull up a spreadsheet real quick. Um, plot natural log of K versus 1 over the temperature. So put these numbers in your spreadsheet. Tell it to calculate this, and um, you know, so the y-axis is going to be natural log k. The x-axis will be one over the temperature. And tell your spreadsheet to give it the um, to give your graph the equation of the best fit straight line. Um, from that, you can find the activation energy because the, the the slope of that line is negative e a over r. So all you have to do is take that slope, multiply it by negative eight point three one four five joules per kelvin mole. Um, So go ahead and give it a shot and come on back when you're done. Welcome back, guys. So here's what I got. So um, I got this this line, it's pretty straight. Um, there's my slope, right? So the um, <clears throat> this slope here is equal to negative Ea over R. Um, and so rearranging this, solving for the activation energy, multiplying by negative R, um, the negatives go away, you get 8.3145 times the, um, 
right here, um, Kelvin, and we get 11,937 joules per mole, or if we put this in kilojoules per mole, which is pretty common, 11.9 kilojoules per mole. It's not too bad, right? We also, if we wanted to, we could find the frequency factor. So 28.7 is 28.07 is the natural log of the frequency factor. So e to the 28th, which is a pretty big number, would be the frequency factor. All right. Well, we don't always have. Don't worry. <laughs> we don't always have to do a graph to um, to solve these problems. If we know the rate constant at two different temperatures, and we certainly did, we had it at more than two temperatures in that previous problem, it works out like this. So plugging in, you know, setting up the Arrhenius equation for the first temperature, call that temperature one, natural log of K1 equals negative Ea over R, whatever, T1 plus natural log of A. Same thing for the second temperature, where the subscripts two represent whatever the second temperature is. So all we have to do, guys, is if we subtract the, the second equation from the first, Okay. First of all, natural log of A goes away. Right? Next, we get natural log of K1 minus natural log of K2, which is the same as natural log of K1 over K2. And that's equal to this term minus this term. Well, first of all, there's an EA over R in common, so we can pull that out in front. And because the minus here makes this a positive, what I do is I say, okay, we have positive EA over R times 1 over t2 minus, this gets our negative sign here, 1 over t1. And this, guys, this is a really useful for us form of the Arrhenius equation because all we need to know is the rate constant um, at one temperature, and we can solve it for the rate constant at, you know, t1, say, and we can find the rate constant at a different temperature. Or if we're um, trying to find the activation energy, all we have to do is measure the rate constant at two different temperatures and we can find the activation energy. So here's an example doing just that. So in this case, we're given the activation energy for a certain reaction as 186 kilojoules per mole. Rate constant is this, liters per mole second, 3.52 times 10 to minus seventh. At this temperature here, it's in Kelvin already. What's the rate constant? So what's our K2 at 723 Kelvin? Why don't you guys go ahead and work this out? One, I'll just um, give you a heads up. Watch out for units here, right? This is kilojoules per mole, which is a really common unit for activation energies. But in, because of the value of R that we use, you should um, either convert this to um, um, joules per mole, so multiply by 1,000 joules per one kilojoule, or if you want to, you can convert R to kilojoules per Kelvin mole by dividing by 1,000. All right, come on back when you get an answer, guys. Welcome back. All right, so there's the Arrhenius equation, this form. This is, honestly, we use this form most often in this class right here. Um, so what I've done here is I've taken E to both sides, the inverse of the natural log function to both sides. So that gets rid of the natural log here. We have K1 over K2 equals E to this whole term right here, to the EA over R1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. Um, and then we want K2. So if we take K2 over here and this whole exponential term down here, we get K1 e to the minus Ea over R, 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. This negative just means it's in the denominator, really. Now we know everything over here, right? Um, so we know our K1. Um, what I did here is I converted my um, activation energy to joules per mole. And just to keep it simple, all I did was I replaced the kilo with times 10 to the third. I'm not worried about having an exact scientific notation with one digit to the left of the decimal. I get the same answer. Um, there's my R, there's my T2. Carefully get the T's in the right place, T2 and T1. And solve this, you guys put it in your calculators. Please make sure you get the same answer. And I find my um, rate constant at this new temperature, 723 Kelvin, as being 4.11 times 10 to the minus three um, liters per mole second. Um, notice it, it got a lot bigger from 10 to the minus 7th to 10 to the minus 3 as the temperature increased. And that's all there is to it, guys.